Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So again, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining today. Uh, welcome to today's webinar during which we will be discussing a pretty big question. Uh, is the EU MDR extension a blessing or a curse? Uh, my name is Waylon, I'll be your host. Um, I'll kick things off with a, a quick round of introductions. Um, a moment, a brief history about me. I bring seven years of, of experience within the life science industry. Um, specializing in implementing different regulatory compliance as well as technology programs to uh, both small and large biopharmaceutical medical device and diagnostic companies. As far as today's agenda, I'll give a quick introduction about Celligence. I'll also introduce today's two wonderful speakers that we have. Um, and then um, from there, you know, our speakers will go through what you see on the agenda today. So starting off with a, an overview of the MDR timeline um, and then getting into some of the different implementation issues. And then uh, at the end, we will have a Q&A. So throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A button uh, within the Zoom uh, taskbar to submit any questions that you have for our speakers. And we'll make sure that we have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to, to go through those. Uh, and if you do have some issues, uh, by the way, feel free to try to put those into the chat too. And um, myself or one of my colleagues will try to figure out what we need to do to make sure that all of your questions are coming through. Okay, so a note about Celligence. Um, start with a brief introduction. So Celligence, we were established in 2017 and Celligence aims to enhance quality, compliance and cost efficiency within the regulatory affairs sector of the life sciences industry. Um, today, we proudly serve a, a diverse range of customers, um, both you know, partnering with small pre-commercialization startups, uh, as well as uh, larger manufacturers of medical devices, diagnostics, and pharmaceutical products. Uh, a couple of our notable clients are here uh, on this slide as well. Um, and then just a quick note about kind of uh, a couple of different technology solutions and services that Celligence provides. Um, so one way that we are delivering uh, regulatory compliance and cost efficiency to the industry is through our proprietary technology called CAPTIS. Um, Cap CAPTIS is Celligence's EU MDR and IBDR compliance platform. Um, so this, this innovative solution, um, it utilizes a number of different automated features as well as artificial intelligence to help organizations increase operational efficiency um, and navigate an increasingly complex regulatory landscape um, and, and also decrease costs when um, creating and updating post-market surveillance documentation. And the idea behind uh, building Captus was to provide a single workspace for medical writers and regulatory affairs team members uh, to combine and perform their systematic literature reviews as well as their adverse events database searches and the creation of their CERs, their PERs, and the other PMS reports that are responsible for, for their product portfolio, um, all within one validated system. Um, and as far as the services and kind of the different areas of expertise for Celligence, there, there's a, a, a very high level overview here. Um, so we do specialize in niche regulatory services for the life sciences industry. Uh, from MDR to IVDR gap analyses to CER writing and device registration, we provide a number of different tailored solutions for uh, global device compliance. And our expertise extends also to the pharmaceutical industry um, where we're providing a number of different services, including ECTD publishing and submission uh, across global markets. And with extensive experience in EU MDR uh, across diverse th therapeutic areas, um, we help clients address notified body observations and, and achieve compliance with global health authorities for their product portfolios. So without further ado, I'll jump into the introductions for today's speakers and we'll get into the, the meat of today's webinar. So um, first I'd like to introduce Joseph Richardson Larby. Um, Joseph is a director of medical device regulatory and, com and medical device regulatory affairs at Celligence. Um, Joseph brings over two decades of experience in the medical device uh, lifecycle management and quality management systems um, to the team at Celligence. His experience includes the preparation and maintenance of technical files, product safety and vigilance reporting, clinical evaluations, risk assessment, regulatory audits, CE and notified body opinion submissions. Um, and Joseph's device experience spans multiple different types of uh, devices and indications, some of which are listed here. 
And secondly, we have Joy Gerdanis. Uh, Joy serves as the director and medical device SME at Celligence. Joy brings over 30 years of experience to the team uh, working within the medical device manufacturing industry as a regulatory professional. Uh, Joy has very strong expertise and inclu that includes executing uh, U.S. pre-market submissions, collaborative interactions with FDA, developing strategies for medical device development, IDE applications, clinical trial notifications, um, and developing and maintaining technical files designed and designed dossiers, as well as supporting international marketing authority. Uh, authorizations. Sorry, it's a mouthful. Both speakers have such a, a deep breadth of experience. Um, there's a lot to go through for both of them. But um, without further ado, I want to make sure that we have ample time and, and really get into today's discussion. So um, we'll kick things off with the MDR timeline overview, and I will pass things over to Joy and over to uh, to Joseph. Um, and, and please do submit your Q&As within uh, using the Q&A button, and we'll make sure that we go through those at the end. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, today's today's webinar, uh, we're going to look at the EU MDR extension and um, whether we deem that as a blessing or a curse. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a quick overview of the um, MDR timeline, um, how we got to the position that we are in now. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, the timeline, but um, allow me to uh, take you through this. Um, so with the timeline, and this is a slightly modified graphic from um, the MedTech slide. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that too. Um, the EU MDR was introduced in April 2017. Um, with an initial or original date of application of three years, um, taking us to um, 2020. And um, we, we all know what happened around the 2019-2020 mark. Um, COVID hit. Um, the industry was impacted um, by COVID. Um, a lot of us had to work from home, um, locked indoors, um, so on and so forth. And, you know, we had an, uh, an additional year of extension. Um, that took us to the date of application, uh, 26th of May, 2021. And um, since then, obviously, industry has been working hard to implement the e EU MDR. But um, the European Commission recognised that um, there were not enough notified bodies. Um, there were not uh, the manufacturers were not prepared enough were not ready for the eu mdr and there was a risk to um, medical device users um, i.e the shortage of medical devices if they were to go by that hard line and you know end things um, around 2024 2025 um, so that's the eu mdr um, timeline um, and in 2023 um, they announced the um, extension to the EU MDR transition timelines, um, taking us from 2026 all the way to um, 2028. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of um, the EU MDR um, transitioning from the MDD to the um, EU MDR. Um, a key, a key point. Some key points to note. Um, as I as I discussed, um, April 2017, date of original um, application, and um, where we are now in 2023. Um, so, what were the um, key issues that we faced um, whilst implementing the EU MDR? Um, in the next few slides, we will look at um, how this impacted the notified bodies and um, how this is also impacting uh, manufacturers in terms of implementing the MDR. So starting with the uh, notified bodies, um, not a lot of people sort of like recognize uh, the impact or the, uh, the burden that the MDR has placed on, on the notified bodies or the actual reason behind why we have, you know, fewer notified bodies in comparison to the 
um, MDD. Um, with the MDD, we had sort of like mid to late 50s um, in terms of the number of uh, notified bodies on the books. And whereas with the um, MDR, we've got within the region of you know mid 30s to mid uh, to late 30s, uh, which is a significant shift um, from or a significant drop from from where we were under the MDD. Um, some of the issues that the notified bodies have faced um, is is what we see on the screen. Uh, one looking at their their resources, um, really how the notified bodies had to conduct their business. Um, a lot of restrictions placed on the uh, notified bodies on um, which role can actually go through the uh, conformity assessment and who can issue the certificate, um, who can review and approve, so on and so forth. And uh, with new codes coming in, um, the Notify bodies had to stack up on, you know, new resources, um, new talent, new expertise, um, experts, auditors, so on and so forth to really conduct the uh, conformity assessment. So the uh, competency scale or, or pack for the notified bodies um, has changed. And, you know, that's a big um, burden to the notified bodies. And that's why, you know, some of the notified bodies looked at the requirement at the beginning, uh, looked at the regulation at the beginning and said, no, uh, I, I don't think we will go down the MDR routes um, solely because of the so-called red tape around it. Okay. Um, other challenges that the uh, notified bodies also faced um, and really point number two um, there was a survey conducted by the um, University of Hertfordshire and one of the key learnings from that um, in conducting this um, survey with notified bodies is the actual designation to become um, the MDR notified body was taking too long. Um, it, it takes a lot of time and, and resource to actually you know, be designated as a notified body. Um, so that's a key learning from that. Um, we've also got, you know, COVID-19 when when that hit and, you know, the original shift from the date of application from um, 2020 to 2021. I mean, that's 12 months and it all has its impact because, you know, uh, manufacturers have to work in a different way. Notified bodies have to work in a different way. Those conducting... Um, conformity assessment, how to find a way to still interact with um, notified bodies, work from home, you know, all of these things. So um, we cannot ignore the impact that that also had um, at the notified bodies and, you know, on the industry as a whole. And there do I bring up the B word, um, Brexit. We've also got Brexit and, you know, unfortunately there were, there were some key players um, based in the UK that were part of the EU and were classed as notified bodies. And, you know, when the um, change happened from the MDD to the MDR, um, some notified bodies, one of them that I, I experienced personally, um, LRQA um, based in the UK, decided to not go down the MDR route, um, meaning manufacturers um, certified by LRQA had to um, change their um, notified bodies, change labeling, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, if you take the number of notified bodies that were held in the UK that were part of the um, Nando list under the MDD, then, you know, you've got um, that also adding to the implementation issues of the um, MDR or, you know, the uh, the risk or the impact to um, availability of notified body of medical devices beyond, you know, um, the year 2024, which is what the main concern of the European Commission was. Looking at the implementation issues on, on the other side for uh, for manufacturers, that's also grouped into, into three main groups. Um, you've got the availability of um, notified bodies where I was saying beginning um, earlier that we had mid 50s to late 50s of notified bodies under the MDD and now we've got mid to late 30s under the MDR 
um, this all adds to the bottleneck that we are all experiencing at the at the notified bodies. Um, so you know, not a lot of notified bodies are available. Um, they are incredibly busy, um, and you know you've got manufacturers switching from one notified body to another. Um, and if you do switch, then you know notified bodies are going to prioritize their existing clients first before looking into new clients. Um, all of that's adding adding up. Um, are the notified still staying on the notified bodies availability, or or notified bodies? You've got the uh, the time to certification also taking a long time. Um, you know when you engage with a notified body. Um, especially if you're not an existing client of that particular notified body, I mean, it could take you somewhere around, you know, you'd be lucky to get um, confirmation within the first three months um, from, from personal experience. Um, it takes it takes a long time. You know, it takes over a year to get a contract signed. Um, that, that, takes, that takes a lot, you know. Um, it also impacts the timeline. Um, when we look at the actual conformity assessment of the MDR itself, um, if you take the timeline, if you put the timeline aside, you've actually got the fees as well. Now, uh, the fees to the MDR, obviously, depending on the classification of the uh, device and uh, the risk of the of the of the device, the risk nature of the device, you are looking at you know the uh, the cost is huge. Um, or the cost could vary. Um, also, what you've got um, impacting the conformity assessment um, is, you know, which route do you decide to go down in? If you decide to go down the standard route or the expedited route, expedited route for some notified bodies, it's you know, twice the cost of the of the standard route. So. This is a key challenge that uh, we must all recognize that uh, manufacturers are facing and, you know, um, was going to contribute um, towards the risk or shortage of medical devices on the, on the, um, on the market. Um, in the, in the second column or second block, we've actually got the, the actual requirement for the MDR itself, uh, you know, the bar had been raised or has been raised um, for the MDR um, following, obviously, you know, PIP, um, uh, breast implants and, you know, um, metal on metal, um, hip implants, all of these things, uh, the issues that were faced there, everything contributed towards, you know, setting the bar higher to weed out the weaker notified bodies, um, you know, you could um, put into bracket shady manufacturers as well. Although, you know, we don't think any manufacturer sets themselves up to be shady, but, you know, um, it is what it is when you try to cut corners and, you know, reduce costs, then, you know, some of this also comes to play. So the MDI itself and the requirement as it is, is, is strict and takes a lot more resource and, and time to implement, um, which is a key thing that the manufacturers face. So, you know, we take a few examples, the reclassification of, of devices. If you were a, you know, simple class one medical device and you got reclassified into a class 2A or class 2B, for example, then um, obviously uh, your clinical data is, is, is wide open. You need a lot more clinical data. Um, you've got the likes of, um, even you take the requirement of a um, post-market clinical follow-up plan that's supposed to be in place. And, you know, the, um, the first stance, uh, from the regulators are you must have a PMCF plan uh, regardless and you know if you come up with a justification then there's a strict criteria that you must meet and uh, very few uh, manufacturers are able to um, go down that route so it, it all places you know um, extra burden on the uh, manufacturers in trying to implement the um, MDR and um, not to mention some manufacturers obviously um, took their time to implement it um, when it was announced in 2017. Um, some manufacturers acted very quickly, promptly, you know, um, up their game with resources, um, getting in, you know, external consultants, 
um, in, involved in implementing or updating the technical files. Um, you had some manufacturers that you know couldn't care less uh, for some for some reason and um, didn't act quickly or quick enough, and you know scrambled at the very last minute to um, implement the um, MDR, and that's also contributed towards. Um, the issues that we are facing, you know, there were there was an element of complacency there um, on the manufacturers um, side of things, and we urge all all parties, both manufacturers and um, notified bodies, to you know do their best and with this new extension timeline to do the best that they can. Um, so you know these are some of the um, issues that the industry faced um, in implementing the MDR. Um, now we're going to look into the um, the actual extension, what it entails, what is it, and um, I'll hand over to my colleague Joy to um, take it from here. Thank you, Joseph. So let's look at the extensions, the details, and the impact that they bring. Uh, the purpose was threefold: uh, to extend the MDD and the AIMDD certificates. Um, not only uh, the certificates validity period, but also um, to extend the transition time of when manufacturers need to be compliant to the MDR. Lastly, they were uh, removing the sell-off period. So what that brought us was um, new timelines for class three, to be implantables are good until December 31st, 2027. And then the class 2B, 2A, and the uh, class one sterile and class one measuring are valid until um, 12, 31, 2028. So, but there's um, criteria that needs to be met and action that needs to be taken in order to qualify. So for the expired certs, um, a withdrawn certificate cannot qualify. It can be expired, but if it was withdrawn, it, it's, not, it's not eligible for an extension. The manufacturer has to take action to lodge an MDR application um, with their notified body and also put an agreement, a signed agreement in place prior to um, the MDD cert expiry. And this application also includes a schedule of when you're going to be submitting your technical documentation for MDR review. And then lastly, um, if, if there's also an exemption per Article 59 or 97, that would apply if you have one in place. Um, then further qualifications that apply to non-expired certs as well as expired certs is that there's restrictions in place that can stifle innovation, such as um, you can't make any significant changes to your design or intended purpose under your MDD cert. Those changes can only be made when you move to MDR, so it would automatically put you in the MDR bucket. And then one of the bigger hitters is, and I think Joseph touched on it, was the stricter requirements for QMS. And the expectation is that your QMS is going to be MDR compliant by May 26 of 2024. So even though your certificate has been extended, you don't have to get an MDR certificate. Your quality management system does require these updates by them. And the MDR application needs to be submitted prior to May 26, 2024. And that signed agreement with your notified body for when you're going to be um, submitting your technical documentation under MDR needs to be in place by September 26, 2024. And then lastly, uh, the device is still required to be safe and compliant to MDD. So we're not sure yet what the notified bodies are going to do as far as monitoring to ensure that um, the products continue to be uh, safe under MDD. So a few key points regarding the extensions is that um, it became ap applicable on March 20th, 2023. And manufacturers need to draft a self-declaration letter of their intent to remain compliant under the MDD and leverage the extensions. 
And then the um, notified body will issue a confirmation letter. Um, there's a template available. Um, if you just Google it, it'll show you what the contents of that are on the left of the slide there. And they will issue that on May 24th, or that's when they issued the, the template, made it available. But lastly, I just want to reiterate again that the QMS needs to be MDR compliant by May 26, 2024. And it's an extensive rehaul of the CER and PMS um, documents is are probably the biggest hitters there. No, yeah, lo loads of changes um, there when, when, when it comes to, you know, the QMS and the um, extension. Um, but Dre, if I may add to this um, one one um, point to also note uh, when it comes to the, uh, the template, um, the European Parliament issued this um, saying, you know, there will be no cost um, for getting the um, confirmation letter from the notified bodies, but um, this is really dependent on how the notified bodies decide to process things under the MDR. And you know, there could be a fee, a fee for um, for them issuing the confirmation letter. So um, do check with your notified body um, um, prior to um, asking for this confirmation letter. And it's, it's only if you really uh, need to issue this confirmation letter, depending on who's asking for it. It's, it's an additional thing to demonstrate compliance. Um, you know, if a distributor or a customer is asking for one, then, then yeah, that's what you could do. If not, then you've got your um, self-declaration letter with your DOC and, you know, that should be okay. But yeah, sorry to interrupt, Joy. Um, Oh, no, thank you. That was all value add. Okay, so um, here we're going to um, look at the um, EU MDRs extension and whether, you know, uh, we deem it as a blessing or as a curse. Um, before we go into that, um, we want to take a quick poll. Um, what do you think um, so far with the information that you know, what you know about the um, extension line, what you actually experiencing, whether you're a manufacturer, a notified body, or you know, a service provider? Do you think the EU MDR extension timeline is a blessing or a curse? Um, we'll give you a moment to um, cast your votes. You have an option coming up on the screen. Um, please choose one. It's either a blessing or a curse. We'll have a look at the results towards the end, um, just before we take the Q&A session. But let's go into the elements of what makes it a blessing and you know what makes it a curse from, from our point of view. On the blessing side of things, the main objective of um, extending the EU MDR transition lines was the risk of shortage of um, medical devices um, on the market. Um, just to give you a scenario, can you imagine walking into your pharmacy or to your uh, primary GP, doctors, surgery, you know, whatever, hospital, clinic, and wanting to, you know, get your blood pressure um, checked or, or, or taken and, you know, the responses, oh, sorry, we don't have any, we've run out of um, blood pressure medical devices, you know, that would be a huge blow to, to you and I as, as users of the medical services. Um, so this is what, you know, the um, European Parliament or, or Commission is trying to avoid. And I think in that case, they've, they've succeeded in um, getting that, um, you know, eliminating the risk of, of shortage of medical devices beyond the key transition line, which was, you know, around the 2023-2024, where a lot of the um, MDD certificates were going to expire. Okay. Um, the, uh, the second point, the um, transition line themselves, you know, the MDR transition um, timeline, um, obviously the manufacturers welcome this news. Um, it's a it's a breather for the manufacturers, and you know, not not to say that they can relax, but um, you know, the rush has somewhat been calmed down a little bit. 
Um, some of them have a little bit more time to now um, implement the MDR fully, um, interact with the notified bodies and, you know, get it done and done properly rather than in a rushed way and, you know, making mistakes and errors along the way. Um, the third point is the MDR cost of implement implementation, um, which has been reduced. Um, now, leading up to the um, original deadline, uh, 2024, uh, May 2024, or you know, around this timeline where we are now, you've had a lot of manufacturers panicking and you know submitting um, expedited um, applications to the notified bodies, those that obviously could afford it because it comes with a hefty cost. Um, but now that you know you realize that you've got a bit more time, I think the um, the wise thing to do is to go standard routes to save some money and you know. Um, utilize the transition time and you know implement the MDR or transition to the MDR. So um, that's what we also see as a a blessing. Um, and you know, unfortunately for some manufacturers that already applied for the expedited route, you know, you can't pull your application, or, or you can, but you know that becomes a risk because then you then go to the back of the queue and you have more time to wait to get to your conformity assessment. Um, the fourth point is um, around competition. Um, from what we see, it increases the competition um, in the industry um, somewhat that, you know, the uh, playing field has now been leveled and there is no um, competitive ad or, um, advantage to one manufacturer that had the resources or submitted the application earlier. Um, we are the same now. We can both play the same same game, same route, and uh, that's what we classify as. Um, it, it will increase the uh, competition within within the industry. Um, the fifth and last point um, under the uh, blessing side of things is it eases the backlog on the uh, notified bodies, and you know what we mean by that is. Um, if we take how the notified bodies have come on board um, since 2017 or, you know, around the 2019 area, um, at some stage we are looking at one notified body being added to the Nando list per month. And, you know, if something like this is to continue, then, you know, from 2023 to 2024 and beyond, there will be more notified bodies being added to the list and you know, manufacturers will have a um, wider choice to uh, to choose from. Um, so in in that case, it eases um, the pressure on the um, notified bodies. If we are to get to, for example, the mid forties of, of of notified bodies on the books, then you know there'll be more notified bodies available to um, manufacturers to in terms of conducting their conformity assessments to the um, EU MDR. Um, so these are some um, points that we've put together that we think, you know, the uh, extension line is a blessing to the industry, uh, not just to manufacturers, but to um, notified bodies and patients and users um, in general. Well, thank you, Joseph. So now we get to talk about the curse side of things. Um, so are the extensions a curse? I, I think they can be in different scenarios. Um, like some manufacturers may be disadvantaged. Like take example, a large manufacturer who already got their MDR application. They may have paid expedited fees, you know, to accelerate the approval. And, you know, to, to gain a competitive ex um, advantage. But now the level, the playing field is leveled and the competitive advantage is gone. And... Sometimes, um, you know, those ex extra costs um, that the manufacturer bear do trickle down and get added to the device, to the cost of the people purchasing them. So that's another reason it could be a, a curse. And that could also price out the, the, um, the manufacturer who paid early to do the MDR um, certification if the devices become too costly because of it. 
Um, the second one that could be considered a curse is, you know, the cost of maintaining the expired MDD. So now the manufacturers have dual systems um, to maintain, not only say, for example, as a part of the MDD is your essential requirements checklist and that technical file needs to be kept state of the art and up to date, as well as now maintaining an MDR um, technical file in the GSPRs. It's just uh, dual, dual work if you're like halfway through and you have some MDR certificates and are utilizing the extension <clears throat> for other MDD products. Thirdly, uh, you know, we got the image here of the foot kicking the can down the road. And I think Joseph touched on complacency that occurred in the past when um, the extension, the first extension was given. Some manufacturers decided to prolong or, or to put off um, getting their MDR uh, compliance in order. And the bolus of manufacturers doing that put a great burden on the notified bodies and they were not able to uh, meet the demand. So we're hoping that we don't see a repeat here with um, procrastination or you know, reallocation of resources that were dedicated to MDR compliance. Now, you know, applied to other things um, and then waiting until the last minute. And then the last point um, that we, we wanted to bring up with the the curse side of things is the EU regulatory reputation. I mean, it, it's it's at stake. They already um, granted how many extensions? If they were to grant another one, um, I think there would be a, a ruckus and a lot of pushback by industry. So our bet is it's not gonna happen again. So we really need to be prepared to make these new dates. Yeah. So exactly. that's what I had for the curse side of things. Yeah. Do you have anything else? Joseph? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, talking about the uh, the regulatory reputation there, you know, of the of the EU. Uh, can you imagine, you know, five, ten years from now, and you know, if the EU or European Commission or, or Parliament decides to um, change the MDR to something else, you know, there will be a lot of pushback um, from the industry to say, hey, you've caused us enough problems. We're not going through that again. And, um, you know, just just stick to the MDR for, for now, um, unless, you know, evidence points towards, you know, the real need to uh, to change it. Um, plus, you know, um, the EU, when you talk to industry experts, you know, the, the EU was somewhat always above the FDA, so to speak, you know, I, I know, Joy, you base you base in the States, um, I'm based in the UK. Um, the EU had one over, over the FDA, you know, the FDA is, you know, gradually catching up now. And, you know, people are trying to look at these two um, key players now to say, hey, uh, which market is going to favor us, favor us the most? Um, so, you know, the EU regulatory reputation is at stake, like you mentioned, and um, it's it's one that will impact the entire industry. And um, we hope such a change and, you know, these extensions are uh, minimized going forward. Um, the the other uh, sort of like jaw dropping moment that, you know, I like to um, put into some of these things into, into perspective is, you know, point number one, for example, um, where, you know, some of the manufacturers are disadvantaged. Uh, I think, Joe, you and I know of um, some manufacturers that have spent a lot of money in trying to implement the um, EU MDR. And I know one key player that spent over a billion dollars in trying to implement the um, EU MDR, you know. Um, so when it comes to spending such money and gaining access to the market, you know, they were ahead, they had a competitive advantage, and now the, uh, the playing field has been leveled. So, yes, it's not a huge disadvantage to them because they still have the devices on the market. Um, users are still going to purchase it, but, um, you know, they've been disadvantaged, you know. Um, you know if you look at it from a commercial lens, um, they are at a disadvantage. Um and you know it is it is what it is, but yeah, these are some of the elements of you know the curse elements that we see. So yeah, yeah good points there, Joy. Thanks.
I think next, if we need to look at the uh, the impact to other regulatory um, authorities, um, really, um, if you look at the um, regulatory authorities that are sort of like annexing from the um, EU MDR, you've got the uh, the UK, uh, but that's stuck to the MDD, and you know they've the MHRA has uh, highlighted that okay, we will accept the um, MDR certificates and we are accepting the extension timelines um, that's uh, that's good but you know it's had an impact to the UK too and you know similarly to um, Switzerland um, that couldn't get their contracts renewed for for several reasons with the EU um, also decided to implement their own version which really it is the EU MDR um, in effect um, but you know They've also welcomed the news because they're piggybacking off the um, EU MDR and, you know, it's had an effect there. Um, so these two uh, markets have also um, accepted the um, extension timeline to the EU MDR. And um, that really brings us to the end of um, today's webinar. Um, we will um, have a look at the, uh, the poll results. Um, um, so let's see. Um, how many votes we had for uh, the blessing and you know the curse and really it, it is it is subjective so um joy what would you vote for do you think it's a blessing or a curse i think i would vote for it's a it's a curse it's cost industry a lot a lot of money and time and resources and haven't really seen a, a big clinical benefit um yeah yeah exactly as a result I'm yeah, I'm of the same point too. I'll, I'll I'll go with the curse more than the blessing. Um, yes, it's a it's a blessing. It's helped some manufacturers. It's easing down the pressure with the notified bodies. But I think you know, looking at the complacency elements, which is you know, um, I experienced that a lot in in, in 2017, 2020. Um, all the signs were there, and you know, we've had another extension. Um, I see it as you know. Uh, when we look at the COVID element um, and, you know, extending the date of application from 2020 to 2021 and still giving the option to issue MDD certificates at the time, which hugely contributed towards the bottleneck that we are experiencing 2024, 2025, um, around that timeline. Um, it's all added to it with all these extensions are, uh, you know, causing a lot of pain, although, you know, they are resolving issues, but if I'm to choose one, then, you know, I'll, I'll basically say it's a curse than, uh, than a blessing. I think that edges it a little bit, but let's see what the participants have voted for. Okay. So, um, it looks like, um, a lot of the participants are really, um, going towards the uh, the blessing side of things. Um, so we've got 68% saying it's a blessing and um, a good 32% um, saying it's a curse. So uh, Joy, it seems you and I are in the minority um, on that one. But like I said, it's very subjective. And um, yeah, everybody has their reason for um, voting. There's no right or wrong um, on this. Um, if you see it as a blessing, then, you know, um, that's good. Um, just make sure that if you're on the manufacturer side, uh, for example, you don't get complacent and um, you still implement the MDR, use that time wisely and um, make sure that you implement it well ahead of time. And um, if it's a curse, then I guess, you know, people that say it's a curse, then we've already done our evaluation and um, we've got our ducks in a row and, um, you know, we're trying to get things done and um, we well ahead of time. So uh, good on you, but yeah, that's the result. So a, a good 68% to the blessing and 32% to the curse. So um, yeah, okay. Um, we can proceed to the Q&A session. Um, yes. Yeah, thanks, Joseph, for going through the poll results. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, I think we are around 100%. Uh, so I, I hope that that's a good sign. This has been a good discussion thus far. Um, we received a lot of questions. We've got about 
uh, 13 minutes left, so try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, I'll start with the, the easiest one. I can answer that. So will the webinar presentation be sent to participants? Uh, yes, you'll all receive that content following today's webinar. Um, the next one, so I'll, I'll just alternate between you, Joseph, and Joy. Um, Joseph, I'll, I'll start with you on, on this first question. Uh, are MDD certificates expiring prior to May 26, 2024? automatically extended until May 26, 2024 by the extension regulation, or does that only apply if the manufacturer has their application approved by the MDD certificate expiration date? Yeah, so um, that will be the um, criteria slide that we had on the um, screen. Um, if your certificate is going to expire before um, May 2024, then there are some key things that you need to do um, now to ensure that you do qualify for the extension. Um, namely, um, the device that is in question has not been withdrawn. Um, you must have lodged an application um, to the MDR notified body. And, um, you know, there are, there are key dates there. Um, so you've got the um, May 2024, and you must have a contract signed by September 2024 as well. So um, that is the timeline. And really, um, if your certificate is expiring before then, then, you know, that's what you should have done. Um, for those that have already expired, you know, then, you know, there was also a um, criteria there. Um, so you just have to follow the um, criteria accordingly. Perfect. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'll, I'll pose this to both you, Joy and Joseph. Um, next question is, what if your technical file is currently under review? Do you still need to draw up this template? Well, <clears throat> I'll try to take that one, Joseph. Um, okay. If, if we're talking about the template being the notified body conformity letter, its intent is if you're going to um, apply the extension to an expired MDD certificate. So it all depends on timing. If your technical file is under review for MDR, um, and your, it depends on when your certificate would expire, but that's probably a really good question to ask your notified body as well. I don't know if you could add something to that, Joseph, or if I if I captured the essence of the question. Yeah, um, Wayne, can you repeat that question again, please? Sure. Uh, what if your technical file is currently under review? Do you still need to draw up this template? Okay, yeah. So the um, intent of the template is uh, voluntary. Um, it's, not, it's not mandatory to really uh, populate the template. It's as it's required within the supply chain. So if you are a manufacturer, um, you might have a distributor that wants to see the validity of your certificate because they probably had the MDD certificate and they know it's expired. So they want to know the current status. Have you lodged an application or not? Um, they all, you know, economic operators within um, the industry as well. So they are aware of the changes to the MDD to the MDR or the MDR um, transition timeline. So um, having the confirmation letter from the notified body is um, not mandatory. Um, if you do need it, then it's an extra to boost your evidence. Um, so that's that one. But the self-declaration um, letter to go with the uh, DOC on file, um, one could argue that that is very important and you must have that um, with, you know, my, my recommendation would be have the um, self-declaration letter attached to your DOCs that you'll be issuing from this point onwards if you are utilizing the um, extension timeline. Great, thank you both. Um, Joy, I'll, I'll start with you on this next question. Shouldn't MDR PMS requirements already uh, have been integrated into the QMS since they are mandatory for all devices since May of 2021? Yes, absolutely, this is true. However, you know, we are seeing industry is behind in updating their QMS, especially in the CE, 
CER and um, PMS areas as clinical evaluation report and post-market surveillance. Um, so I thought it just important to reiterate and, and get that message out there that this is the expectation at the time of your MDR application, your QMS should have already been updated to MDR. So thank you for that question. Perfect. And Joy, I'll stay with you for the next question. How about new medical devices? Should, um, should we implement MDD or MDR for a new CER mark? Yeah, any new device um, that's not already CE marked would be required to go under the MDR route. It's not an option to go under MDD for new products. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you. I still see some more questions coming through. We've got about eight minutes left, so I'll try to get through. Uh, let's go with Joseph for the next one. So can you outline again the cost and if the letter for confirmation extension is warranted in all cases? Sorry, so the first is the cost and the second bit is? Um, the second one was, can you, so yeah, can you outline again the cost and if the letter for confirmation extension is warranted in all cases? Yeah, so um, I'll take the latter first. Like I said, um, on 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 one of the answers, um, the confirmation letter is uh, not mandatory, so that's voluntary. Um, it's as it's required. So you know, if you've got an economic operator asking for it, then that's an extra evidence that you can um, supply, um, in addition to your DOC and self declaration letter. Um, regarding the cost, that really um, varies. So uh, here, I'm, I'm not sure about, about the cost, um, Waylon. Is it the cost of probably getting the uh, notified body confirmation letter? Um, I, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll touch on um, both both cases for cost. Um, the European Commission, when they issued the um, extension, they were or they are anticipating that there should be no cost associated with um, producing the um, notified body confirmation letter. However, notified bodies operate very differently and they may decide to charge. Um, as far as I know, at the moment, status quo, um, I haven't seen or heard of any charges um, being made by the notified bodies, but that could vary. So um, really, you need to contact your notified body um, with regards to that. And really, if it's the cost of the um, conformity assessment to the MDR, really, that is... Um, device classification specific and you know the route that you decide to go down on whether it is a standard route or an expedited route perfect um this next this next one's pretty interesting so joy joseph i'm gonna ask you to kind of look into the future and and think about this one a little bit so the question was will the extension merely result in a uh, a later bottleneck as a lot of companies will now take time to reflect and see how early adopters got on and what issues they faced. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is why I voted that you know the extension line is a is a is a curse because um, I can see that happening um, if we don't get enough notified bodies on the on the line to conduct the conformity assessments, or if the notified bodies are not able to. Um, clear the cues that they currently have or the bottlenecks that they have um, conducting the conformity assessments. So this is why we all need to make use of this timeline, put in the application as soon as possible and get onto the books of the notified bodies. And this is why with the extension, although it's going up to 2028, the European Commission is trying to make sure that there is time for an application and that's why they've put in application by the 26th of May 2024 which is what a good what, eight months or so nine months or so from now um, to um, lodge an application and you've got then another four months from then to really make sure that the contract is signed and like I said um, earlier on signing the contract could take up to a year so it was announced in March 2020. We are in, in August. Um, 
it takes about a year. So even if you lodge your application now, worst case scenario, a year from now, you should be able to have a contract in place. So um, all the signs are there. We need to make sure that uh, um, we are making use of that timeline. Um, otherwise, those applying after the 26th of May um, cannot really guarantee that they will have a contract in place by September 2024. And if that's the case, then you don't qualify for the extension timeline and you just have to go through the um, MDD. But yeah, that doesn't mean there will not be a um, queue or bottleneck at the notified bodies. That is really depending on the number of notified bodies that we get on the um, Nando list. And, and Joy, anything to add there? No, I think he pretty much covered it. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Great, uh, Joseph. I think you actually answered this this in your in your last response, but I'll I'll put it out there. Um, so the formal application for conformity assessment under MDR should be done before certificate expiry date or before May twenty six, twenty twenty four. Yeah. So um, the MDD uh, certificates shouldn't be. The original date of uh, expiry shouldn't be beyond the 26th of May, 2025 anyway. Um, so all MDD certificates are slated to expire before then. If yours is expiring before the 26th of May, 2024, then you have to follow the criteria, um, lodge an application, um, even after expiry, you still have that date. It's still the 26th of May, 2024 to lodge the application and, you know, get the contract confirmed by um, the 26th of September, 2024. Got it. I hope okay, I answered that correctly. Yeah. I, I think so. We have we have one minute left. Um, so we'll go ahead and put, I do have one more question, um, but in the meantime, Contact information is here. There were a couple of others that came in late that we did not get to. Um, please, please feel free to reach out to to any of us um, that you see here on the screen. Happy to get back to you. Schedule a call as necessary to discuss uh, whatever your question is. Um, so, final question before we drop: Should I have? And I'm I'm sending this to you, Joy. Um, should I have two tech files, one for MDD and one for MDR, or can I have one tech file that references MDD and MDR? Yeah, you can definitely have one technical file that references both. Um, I think they share more similar and same information than different. The biggest difference may be the essential requirements checklist needs to remain intact and can be an annex, as well as the GSPRs. So I hope that was helpful. Great. We are right at time. Um, again, I, there are a couple of questions we didn't get to. Please do reach out. Uh, we're happy to hop on a call. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. And until next time, uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.